Have you ever looked around at the convenience you have in your life and wondered, is this how God wants us to live? That's what we'll talk about today. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven thirty one. In my other podcast, Start With Small Steps, I've been talking about the issue of convenience and how it affects our life, how it affects our health, and whether maybe inconvenience is putting us at a disadvantage. The question I'd want to talk about here is what does inconvenience mean or comfort in life mean to a Christian? Jesus tells us that we have to take up his cross. Jesus tells us that we have to follow him. Was it convenient for Matthew, who had a pretty good job, to follow Jesus? Was it convenient for Andrew and Peter to follow Jesus when they had a family business? Everyone who went off and followed Jesus gave up something, gave up something that was comfortable to them. But we also know that God loves us. He wants us to have what we need in life. But that's the question. What is it that we need? And what is it that we want? And what is it that God expects from us to do for him, his followers, his people? What does it mean to be committed to Christ? But does that mean that we also have to remove ourselves from comfort and inconvenience? It's a really hard question. And I suspect that the answer in the end has a lot to do with the money that that young prince had. Is convenience so high up in your life And he would tell you, sell all your conveniences and follow me. Or maybe is it's more like the apple being held out in front of Eve, telling her the one thing she wanted to hear. If you eat this, you'll know everything. You'll be like God. Convenience is telling us, you can have it all. You can have the life you've always imagined. Just take a bite of this apple. Is that what convenience is to us? A temptation? away from God. And I think that in the end, that is the problem, is we like convenience. Do we love convenience? And do we love convenience? Like when we talk about the love of money and how it's harder to go to heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of the needle because we love convenience. It's not the convenience that's the problem. It's not even the money that's the problem. It's our love of it That is actually the problem. So that's where I thought we'd pick up on this particular piece. The other podcast used the framework of a book, The Crisis of Comfort, but he didn't really talk about faith issues other than the fact that he goes through an Eastern practice of misogi, which is a hard thing that won't kill you, but is difficult in order to get that cleansing by fire. We don't need to really talk about a cleansing of fire, but we do need to think about how convenient how comfortable our lives are, and is it a problem if we're too comfortable? In our modern times, particularly in America, we are obsessed with comfort. My chair is not comfortable. I got a new chair. If this isn't working in my house because I don't enjoy sitting on it, I'm going to find something else. So that becomes our first issue with comfort and convenience, is the fact that we are given resources in life, we're given gifts in life, And does our desire for comfort, our desire for convenience, affect how we spend our money so that we're not helping the poor, we're not helping those around us, and we're not helping our church? I think that right off the top of the head, when I looked at convenience in my own life, it's true. You know, I grew up poor, and this is the first time I had money in my life. And so suddenly, I'm enjoying things a little bit more. I get to relax a little bit more. And I'm thinking about my retirement and how I can plan for it better. But is that how God told us how we should look at our resources? Probably not. So that is the very first thing, is that when I focus myself on comfort and I focus myself on convenience, it has a lot to do with how I spend my time, how I spend my money, and what I really should be doing with it. I think convenience, like everything, you know, what we have, again, like money or other things, 
is not good or bad. It's not evil or virtue. It's not going to crush us or is it going to help us. It can help in some ways. I find it nice because I can open up my computer. I can look at logo software, which isn't cheap, and clearly read the Bible. I have a whole room right here of books that I can use as resources. So it has a good in my life. But it also means, too, that maybe I depend so much on those good things and spend so much money on the good things that my focus is somewhere else. One of the chapters in The Crisis of Comfort talked about that maybe the bad part about comfort isn't so much that it is comfort itself. It is what the pursuit of comfort leads us towards. It is about the time we spend investing in comfort, investing in our perfect lives, and what is it taking us away from that we can no longer do because we don't have time and resources to do those other things. Are we not devoting ourselves to God? Are we not sacrificing ourselves for neighbors or for the poor? Are we not spending time working with the church or other organizations to bring the message of God to other people? So again, it's not something I can tell you, but it's something I know in my own life. Again, we only have so many hours in a day. We only have so many dollars in the bank, and we have only so many hours we're awake. What are we doing with the resources we're given? And comfort can be alluring. Comfort can drive us away and make us want to get that. But we could also use the comfort that we have in order to bring out the message of God, use our resources that we have to share the message of God. I'm hoping, in a sense, that's why I made this podcast. I had the other podcast, it was going pretty well. And then I thought, I needed to do something in pursuit of faith, in pursuit of trying to give back. Someone gave me a witness and told me about Jesus and helped my path to Jesus. I want to do that for someone else. How are we spending our money and our resources? And then the second question is, is are we using the comfort that we have towards good? Or are we using it towards basically being more relaxed than we normally are? I think the third problem comes in a long time with messages, too. You hear it on television or all these other pieces where there's the health and wealth ministry, right? God will make us rich. God will make us comfortable. All we have to do is believe in Jesus and call out those things, and we will get everything that we want to get. And that is not what God promised. God told us when we follow him, we will follow him all the way to the cross that we have to leave our mothers and fathers, meaning like as the most important thing in our lives, these are all uncomfortable things. Jesus never promised us that we are going to have a comfort-filled, non-stressful life, that it's not going to hurt, that we're not going to encounter people against us, and we're not going to have adversity in our life, health adversity, money adversity. We are in this world just like Jesus was in the world, And so we're going to have the whole world experience, but the difference is, is we know how the last page goes. We know how the story ends, and that's us with Jesus, and hopefully hugging and grabbing as many people as possible and taking them with us. We want everyone to be there. So the question is then, are we giving a promise or are we being told a promise of comfort and convenience. All we have to do is believe in Jesus a little bit harder. I remember when I was a brand new Christian, someone in a job situation told me, hey, the faith of a mustard seed can move mountains. So therefore, if you're not moving mountains, hmm, what does that say about your faith? So it's almost like the opposite of the health and wealth ministry. It's the Obviously, if you don't have health and wealth and aren't getting a ton of things done, your faith of a mustard seed must not even be existent at all. And so that was another terrible message. So the third problem with convenience is what message are we getting either from the world or giving to the world? Are we telling people that their problems will be solved? Are we telling ourselves that our problems will be solved and that we'll have the most convenient life ever? Then I think the fourth problem happens when we turn 
a blind eye to what's going on in the world. When we sit in our pew and then every Sunday contribute our Sunday worship and then we're done for the week, which is not supposed to be how it is, but then we watch other things happen in our country, in our neighborhoods. We don't help people the way we could. We don't stand up for people the way we should. Sometimes we don't say things when we know something is clearly a truthful point because we're afraid of being shamed or canceled and we're unwilling to stand up for what matters because we're scared and we're scared of losing our comfort. What if I say this thing and I lose my job? What if I say this other thing and my friends hate me? What are you willing to lose in order to speak the truth? So that is the next problem we have is silencing our real messages because we don't want to lose the conveniences that we have. God asks us to be the ambassadors on earth and tell the truth. Doesn't mean sharing the bad news of Jesus. It's about sharing the good news of Jesus. But it also means that we have to stand up for what's really important in our world and stick to biblical truths. The next question comes up is, are we being self-centered? Are we only looking after our own needs? It's a little bit about turning the blind eye to the world. I will tell you, I am right there with you. I get obsessed about how my job is doing. Can I afford this house? What is my retirement going to look like? Me, 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 me. The question is, what are we doing by just focusing in on ourselves? And sometimes that's what comfort literally does to us. I just worked very hard to get a new job so that my retirement years could be better. I could retire at a decent time, and I don't have to worry about what I'm going to eat. But then again, it's all about me. And when we talk about things like the Lord Prayer, it is our Father, meaning us, all of us. And we talked a little bit about this in the community. But if we're just focused in on ourselves, this self-centeredness, looking at all the things that we only care about and not looking at the world around us and to see what we could do to make the world a better place, then we're missing out. C.S. Lewis said that we are not like Jesus because our will and the interests of everyone else isn't exactly the same. Our will might not be God's will. Jesus' will was God's will, and so they were the same. And so if we are just, quote, a bundle of self-centered fears, hopes, greeds, jealousy, and self-conceit, all doomed to death. That's what we become if we become too self-centered and not look at the world through God's eyes. So that is the next problem that we have when we have too many comforts as a Christian. I know I think about it too, because I think, again, do I want to go to church on Sunday? Do I want to go to church on Sunday? That book about community made it clear that everything we do gives a message to other people. And when we stop going to church, maybe other people stop going to church. And we're perhaps giving a bad image of what church matters. We're showing people who are not churchgoers that church doesn't matter. And we're saying the same message to the people around us. But when I wake up on Sunday morning, I think, hmm, do I want to go to church? That's a problem because we only think about what we want. And I think the last problem, and again, you might have noticed these are all intertwined, is when we're just thinking about us and then we're thinking, do I want to go to church on Sunday? We're also thinking about, do I want to tell someone about Jesus? Do I want to show them the way to heaven? I gave that example when I was talking about evangelism in the first few episodes of this podcast. There was a bridge that was out and you think, oh, I got to tell these people the bridge is out. They're all riding bicycles and they're headed towards the bridge. And you think nah, I'm kind of tired today. I'll come out and tell people tomorrow. It's too late. And so we get inconvenienced even to the point of telling people about Jesus, about how much he loves him. He wants them to come back because this isn't the best day for it. I'm kind of tired. So not only is convenience causing us where to spend our time, our effort, our focus, our attention, It's also talking to us about whether or not we even talk to people about Jesus. We go and help the poor. We go out and work towards other people because you know what? I didn't sleep so well last night and it'd be super nice to watch that new Star Trek show tonight. We get comfortable with a group of people. 
We like our people. We like our friends. We like the group we hang out with. Maybe we belong to some clubs. And we get comfortable with that. The interesting thing about Jesus is he hung out with everybody. People who were comforting to him. People who challenged him. Or people who needed him desperately but didn't want him in their lives. He hung out, as people always talk about, the tax collectors, the women who didn't do what they were supposed to do, the church leaders, the poor people, the people who just wanted to hear the message of God, everybody. He hung out with everybody. So part of our convenient life might cause us to stand away from other people who are less convenient to us, people we wouldn't want to be seen with, people who we wouldn't want to hang out with people who maybe embarrass us in certain ways. And so then we don't go and talk to everybody. That person voted this way. I don't want to talk to them. This person looks like that. Do I want to hang out with someone that looks like that? It's very against what Jesus always did. He was everybody. His family of believers when he was on earth, different people who suddenly found themselves sitting next to each other, listening to Jesus talk. Someone talked interestingly about World War II, and that was a draft where everybody went to war. It wasn't rich people getting their kids out. It wasn't people in government somehow finding ways to keep their children from serving in the military. Everybody went. A historian said about that and why he thinks the culture of the United States after World War II was a lot different is you were fighting side by side with someone who grew up in the cornfields of Iowa, New York, the big city, the richest kid from the richest mogul in the biggest industry. And you were brothers in arms, side by side. You fought together. And not only that, but when you were in the bunkers waiting for whatever to happen, you talked to each other. You got to know each other. When you listen to these interviews from people of World War II, they talk about these very different people that became closer to anyone in their entire lives to them because they fought that war together. In a sense, I think Jesus did the same. Suddenly you saw Nicodemus maybe sitting next to a person who used to be infected with leprosy. Never would have seen such a thing in a community like that. The time of Jesus' arrival on earth was very segmented. The Greeks didn't like the Romans, and the Romans didn't like anybody else, and the people who were in charge of the temple didn't want to talk to the rabble, and the rabble didn't want to talk to that rabble, and no one really hung out together. But Jesus brought them all together and brought them to say, this is about me. This is about us being together, a family, closer than a family. In that same sense, I think, when thinking about the World War II veterans, they got to know each other, the apostles, regardless of where they came from. They probably didn't want to hang out with Matthew at first, and they probably never wanted to hang out with Paul, very clearly, but they became apostles together. They broke bread together, they took communion together, and together they had their feet washed by Jesus, the ultimate servant. So is our convenience keeping us in our social circle so that we don't meet other people? We don't see other people who challenge us, who maybe we don't want to hang out with, but need the message of Jesus just like everybody else. And maybe even in the end, inconvenience is how we get out of this loneliness. People feel so isolated. And if you don't feel isolated, and you can bet there's a lot of people around you who do, So being inconvenienced by having them over for dinner, joining a church group with them, talking to them about some of the problems they're having over a milkshake, trying to figure out what's going on with them. If we inconvenience ourselves, we'll be less lonely, and we can make other people feel less lonely too. Someone said at one point that there's 79% of America feels lonely for the most part. And we have to think not just about what our church is doing or, gee, will our pastor get on top of that and help people who are lonely? But what are we going to do about it? How are we going to help the loneliness, the isolation? And I think about how many people, when I was a kid, 
And they knew I was a kid that was potentially in trouble because my childhood wasn't great. Opened their doors to me. Invited me to dinner. Let me be a part of their family just for a night. That kind of stability meant everything to me. And it taught me that my situation wasn't the way things were supposed to be. And gave me examples of what is really important about community. I have people today who have made me part of their family. And am I making someone a part of my family? Something for me to think about, too. The last inconvenience thought that I had is really not necessarily a problem with inconvenience like I've been listing currently. But when you think about inconvenience, isn't that what Lent is all about? That Jesus had his 40 days in the desert. He walked the wilderness. The first day of Lent was day 46 before Easter. And so it was all those days of pain, suffering. We give up things for Lent before Easter, many things, some things that we actually really like in order to give a sacrifice like Jesus sacrificed for us. And the goal is is to make us closer to God. I had the podcast about Lent and some other things that you can give up for Lent to make it matter more in your life and more thoughtful about what you're going through in the pre-Easter time. But the Lenten fast and the practices we have towards Lent is about making us less convenient. We can't eat the thing we want to eat. We can't maybe do the thing we like to do. The idea is that we give up something important to us. It's not a vegetarian giving up meat. It's not a person who doesn't own a TV giving up TV shows. It's about someone taking something that matters to them and giving it up. Jesus was offered food by the devil, rocks into bread. He said no, even though he was starving. The devil tempts us with things. And that practice of inconvenience, of maybe having a little less comfort in our lives, means that we can share in that walk a little bit. So I think in the end, it's not that convenience or comfort is a problem. It is a thing. It depends on where we put it in the world. We have to ask ourselves, what is it keeping us from? So my challenge to you is think in your own life, how does convenience keep you from the things that really matter, the people who really matter, sharing the word of God with other people, taking a lonely person in and giving them a little bit of a family for a night, or causing our money to be spent in ways that maybe could be spent helping other people. Try to come up with one thing, one comfort that you could do that could make a difference in someone else's life. Maybe you give up a coffee to help a local shelter. Or maybe you decide once a month you're going to invite a bunch of kids at your church to come over for dinner so they can have a good meal and maybe do a Bible study. But think of something that matters to you. And think about how comfort and convenience plays a role in your life. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to tell someone else about the podcast. If you go to a prayer group or have a Bible study, if you have something that you want to ask me, or if your Bible study wants me to talk about a particular topic, happy to do whatever it is that would help you. If you have something that you want me to pray for, I'm happy to pray for you too. So you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'm also found on Twitter, and those links are in my show notes. And remember, the road to making other people's lives better and our own life begins with small steps. 